Vietnam ex-communists, you simply not only become a capitalist, but maybe this is the ultimate historical function of the old communist left, <laughs> to turn into a supreme, the best manager of the most brutal capitalism, you know. They obviously do this quite well. One, the other function is uh, Venezuela to screw it up, and I'm following there closely the situation. I know it's true, United States are waging economic war and so on, but sorry, they also screwed it up. It's them, uh, or Podemos, which is clear now, I read, uh, if some guys are here from Spain, I hope you can refute me, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can deny what I'm saying, but my impression, reading their electoral, uh, it's very beautiful, done in a almost fashion style, their electoral manifesto. Listen, it's basically, okay, maybe this is a dignified thing to do, why not? It's basically a very modest social democracy. But the, what Podemos wants to do is raise taxes a little bit for the rich ones, to spend a little bit more for, and so on. Or uh, you do what happened in Greece. And this since I got into so many troubles because I'm opposed to both sides there. On the one hand, I'm opposed to the line we had to do it, but the government did it. I'm just curious because some of you, if you were here, must remember that this was my standard joke here. Every time that we had a debate about Greece, I used on purpose the same joke. I can imagine how a couple of years from now you will have well-paid jobs and then once a year you will meet, wasn't it nice when we were demonstrating, but then a phone will ring, oh sorry. But I'm sorry to tell you, that's now a reality. I can imagine, I will not name them people who also gave lessons to you here, who, you know, like they give talks about left in Greece and then, uh, then the phone rings, sorry, we have to pass a new law for austerity, you have to run to the parliament <laughs> and so on, you know. But, what I, so I think that shouldn't. I don't support the government here. But I also absolutely opposed, how are they called, People's Forum or whatever, the... Popular Union. Popular Union. I think, I read in detail, again, their program. I think it's a totally naive bullshit. It would have been a total catastrophe. And the weak point, I read the interview of, uh, of uh, Statis Kouvelakis in, he supports them, Popular Union, in you left review, and it's so clear how he gets confused. At what point? His idea is Grexit would have been a big heroic measure. We stand up, we do it, you know. I'm sorry to tell you, I know this from Varoufakis and other sources. You know, Varoufakis is telling this story and I checked it up from my Slovene side. I know some negotiators uh, who were in, it in Brussels. When Varoufakis at some men committee there mentions, he thought they would like uh, shit in their pants. Oh, what radical gesture, uh, we will do Grexit. You know what Wolfgang Schäuble said? Perfect, we support you. Do you need 10, 20 billions to do it? No, this is why. Although I doubt if it was feasible, but I think Varoufakis, forget about his clownish uh, aspect, that's why I'm friend with him. He <laughs> reminds me of myself sometimes. No? That's why he was right. He was against that capitulation for austerity. But at the same time, his point was not Grexit, remain within Europe, make trouble within Europe. And from what I've heard, his idea with some parallel euro currency, whatever, I cannot guarantee if it would have worked or not. But if it would have worked, I tend to agree. We did the deposit, because again, it was absolutely crucial to remain within Euro also and to make trouble there. Because if Greece were to find a way to avoid austerity and remain within Europe, uncontrollable, that would have really thrown them into panic. Greece out, it's not a problem. It's another Belarus or those 
ridiculous countries and uh, the, the crisis would have exploded, would have exploded. Okay, let's not lose time. So, uh, 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 what I want to tell you, another thing is that, again, I'm sad that I'm not here able to listen to others because, like, I saw that uh, Harvey had a talk, maybe I can use you as spice, that uh, it's a Marx theory of value, you know. Like, uh, I, a couple of times I asked him, like, you know, it's a great problem, so-called, let's avoid now the debate, is it the proper term or not, labor theory of value. Yes or no today? Yes, it starts tomorrow. Ah. <laughs> no, because the last time, at a round table, I don't know where, uh, he, uh, even in his book, one of those reading capital book, he is more skeptical than not. But I wonder, so I will really have to use you as spice to tell me, because you know what my enigma? Okay, the cases against are clear, because... I know some guys from Princeton who are very much leftist, who demonstrated in a wonderful way how Marx's so-called labor theory of value, which also presupposes a certain very physical, linear, physical in literal sense, you know, where the, the very term Arbeitskraft, Marx took it from uh, mechanical physics. Like, uh, uh, all, you know, all those theories of how uh, mechanisms work and so on. So, uh, the necessary, uh, the necessary uh, implication is of Marx that uh, so-called complex labor, which has higher value, can be reduced to simple labor. That is just multiplication of simple labor. And then, as David Harvey notices, Marx's argumentation is very strange. He just says, experience shows us this, never mentioning what experience and so on. <laughs> Why is this such a problem? Because if you, uh, if you, if we drop labor theory of value, then off goes the exploitation. How do you ground then the notion of exploitation, that working class is exploited. I mean, the whole point of exploitation is grounded on labor theory of value. I think it can be redeemed, but how, who knows, and so on and so on. Uh, the <coughs> last point, just, and then we go, we do some serious, let's go work. Uh, I just want to warn you of many polemics in which I am now involved, although people are mostly attacking me, how incredible the level of attacks on me is getting. Like, do you know a guy called, Susan, did you meet him, that, how is he called, Dabishi, or what? A total jerk from Colombia. I'm uh, sorry if I awakened you if you were sleeping. <laughs> yeah, Dabashi, sorry. Look, this guy is simply a total liar and a jerk. He wrote a book, Can Non-Europeans Think? Attributing, of course, me to this statement. And the title of the first chapter is Fuck You, Walter Mignolo. <laughs> he not only claims that I said this, but he even describes the scene that at the beginning of one of my lectures, I started with, fuck you, Walter Mignolo, with all the, with my lovely way, uh, sorry, lively way, waving my hand, and he gives no reference. Then I look into, on the web, and I found only one reference, a transcription of a talk of mine. Okay, I looked that, of course I never say it. What happens is just this, is that, uh, uh, at the beginning, I, in very soft terms, I mean, Walter Mignolo, in his first attack on me, he started this, brutally violent. Okay, I just reply to some of his arguments. My main argument, which is a very general one, is that, the basic Marxist one, that uh, you cannot fight global capitalism through reference to some local traditional resistances, and so on and so on. You know, this game of post, some post-colonialists. No. Okay, you may disagree or not, but I never said... Then, later, in a totally different context, 
somebody asks me something. Walter Mignolo is nowhere in sight. And answering this guy, I tell him, listen, but fuck you, how do you mean this? And so on. So now, the problem is that this now was brought together into, I began a lecture with fuck you, Walter Mignolo, and then it already became a uh, well-known fuck you, Walter Mignolo, and so on, as if, and it's incredible how I'm caught in some kind of unconscious mechanism where, as Freud says, denial doesn't work, because the more I deny it, the more the rumor circulates, and he does, uh, there is a pearl in that book, you should look it. Uh, uh, he, that is to say Dabashi, is furious because I quote, I refer positively, I try to redeem Franz Fanon. So, he quotes, uh, it's a long passage, one page from me, and then attacking me ferociously for total misreading of Fanon. There is one slight problem. I couldn't believe my ears. It's a quote from Fanon himself, not from me. I mean, it's just, uh, I tempted simply to stop doing these things. <laughs> okay, so let's nonetheless, so that I don't get lost, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't lose too much time. I did, I'm sorry. Let's do some job. First, I would like with polemics to some of my friends, I will not name them, I would like to begin with the big problem for some of today's internationalist leftists, the relationship between universal struggle, it's a very boring problem, universal struggle for emancipation and particular way of life <coughs> identities. The solution, the predominant leftist post-colonial solution is that the two have to be kept apart, in the sense of every way of life group, ethnic group, should have the right to each, to their specific way of life, I specify, their uh, religion, language, the way they interact, their re uh, uh, private life, intimate life, rituals, and so on and so on, that the two should be kept apart a specific way of life and struggle for universal <coughs> emancipation. Uh, okay, I will nonetheless risk it because he's a good friend of mine, but uh, now I'm involved in a fr very friendly, but nonetheless sharp polemics with him. Uh, Alain Badiou makes this reproach against me lately, that I get caught into too much of Pro, like he, in a ridiculous way, describes my position as if refugees come to Europe, they should take a quick course in Western civilization <laughs> and so on, that I'm a colonialist here, uh, Western values and so on and so on. Although, you know, he attacked me so much that I'm almost tempted to answer, fuck, fuck you, <laughs> not <laughs> Walter Mignolo, but uh, like, <laughs> yes. Because you know why? The only, the main argument that I hear about Western values is, but they are hypocritical. They preach human rights, but look what they did, killing millions. They are hypocritical. My God, I'm not saying this, but I'm tempted to say, yes, but at least they are hypocritical. You know, this hypocrisy gives you an opening. Like when in Stalinism there was no hypocrisy, you know, because... It was simply, okay, but let me go on. What do I find problematic in this? I simply think that one cannot distinguish in such a clear way the universal dimension of the emancipatory struggle and the identity of a particular way of life so that we can all together engage in a universal struggle and simultaneously fully respecting the right of each group to its particular way of life. One should never forget that for a subject who lives a particular way of life, all universals appear to him colored by this way of life. Each identity, way of life, comprises also a specific way to relate to other ways of life. 
So that's for me the first crucial thing. We are not in this sense split subject that now I deal with my specific way of life, how we eat, how we pray, whatever, and then apart from this I have some universal struggle. No, universality is redefined in every way of life. That's why way of life is a totality, a way of life. So when we pose as a guideline that each group should be left to enact its particular identity, to practice its own way of life, the problem immediately arises. Where do customs that form my identity stop and where does injustice begin? Are women's rights just our custom or is the struggle for women's rights also universal and as such part of the emancipatory struggle? Is homophobia just a thing of particular culture to be tolerated as a component of their identity the same goes for arranged marriages and so on and so on. Like, this is a problem. There are some groups, like in my country, Roma, to use the politically incorrect term, the gypsies, for whom it's absolutely clear. Sorry, arranged marriages are the very core of their way of life. If you don't accept arranged marriages, then Again, now I like to play Walter Minolo. Then fuck you with your multiculturalist respect of the other and so on. Now to avoid a fatal misunderstanding. I'm well aware that this mediation of the universal with the particular way of life holds also for our Western way of life. The universal principles advocated by the West are also colored by our way of life. Plus, we should never forget that the rise of religious nationalist fundamentalism now, which happens, so that religious fundamentalism today is not only a matter of some third world countries or even just some Muslim countries. We have it in our own countries. And for me, it's especially enigmatic the case of Poland. Why? Because the usual leftist uh, explanation of this new rise of ethnic religious fundamentalism in post-communist uh, post, uh, European countries, Poland, Baltic countries, and so on, is disappointment of capitalism. People expected too much from capitalism, then there was the disappointment, and now they seek refuge in old Catholic whatever traditions. But Poland is a much more enigmatic case. Listen, if there is a relative economic, genuine, post-communist success, it's Poland. I, even with inflation-adjusted numbers, the per capita product doubled. Although you have class differences and so on, everybody knows the standard of living for the majority did raise and so on. And nonetheless, you have an extremely harsh re-emergence of Catholic uh, uh, conservatism, which goes pretty far, you know, so if I repeat myself, do you know the story that, for example, now already they have a very tough anti-abortion loss. Now they want even to close the gap with those minimal exceptions. They had three exceptions. Uh, the, when when uh, the, the birth could threaten mother's life, if it's a result of rape, and if the fetus is how do you call it, ill, demented, whatever, that the monster is born. They want now to cut off even these three. Why? You cannot say, you know, this standard pseudo-Marxist argument, oh, it's disappointment, uh, and so on. Or I will give you another example. It, it quite shocked me. It quite shocked me. Now I will tell you that in a Middle East country, and check it on the web, in a Middle East country, the supreme religious figure said, referring to sacred texts, said that in a wartime situation, raping enemy women who are captured is justified. Now you will say, ho ho, I'm playing Islamophobia. Sorry, now it, you know who said this a week ago, or a month ago, sorry. The chief rabbi, yes, of IDF. Isn't this sad? So you can see how 
totally bullshit. This idea is, you know, enlightened Israel against the uh, primitive Muslims uh, around <laughs> and so on and so on. No, I think that there are still some elements on the West Bank, Palestine, which are definitely now more enlightened, secular and so on. You know who is my hero now? Uh, I want to now to write a text uh, Shylock as a Palestinian hero. Shylock, you know, the Jew, Shakespeare. Because it happened again, and maybe you know the answer. From what I know, Israeli authorities are just silently trying to ignore it. You know that uh, some uh, Israeli young boy, young, okay, adolescent boys burned a Palestinian home and they killed one or two children. I don't know what. And then the lawyer of the family said something which is absolutely obvious. He said publicly, but listen, Israel has a law for this. This clearly is a terrorist attack, a killing. And Israel, as you probably know, strictly applies the rule to uh, Palestinians that when somebody is convicted of a terrorist attack, the house of the family is destroyed, blown up. So he simply says, please now, there are two guys, please, will Israel destroy also the houses of, of those two? Of course, no answer and so on. This is, I think, wonderful Shylock gesture, you know, like that uh, it would be interesting because we read so much about how uh, the West in contact with third world or whatever less developed so-called cultures uh, uh, applies this legal regulation exchange law. No, the West at the same time, and it's a big story from uh, Native Americans how the West imposed contracts on so-called Indians, Native Americans, and then violated these contracts again and again. So I think the very intelligent strategy today is not we are natives, we don't obey your laws, but please stick to your own laws, my God. Obey at least your own laws. It, it's an interesting position. Okay, but let me go on. Back to this uh, uh, gap that separates universality from particular way of life. So what I propose is to bring the struggle into every particular way of life. Each particular way of life is antagonistic full of inner tensions and inconsistencies. And the only way to proceed is to work for an alliance of struggles in different cultures. Uh, and I think, again, this is absolutely crucial today. Communist struggle for universal emancipation means it's not simply we all enjoy our particular way of life and then somehow on the top of it we have universal goals, screw capitalism, whatever. No, uh, the struggle for universal emancipation means a struggle which cuts into each particular, uh, uh, into each particular identity. And here I'm critical to all sides. For example, uh, another, <coughs> <coughs> for example, now, I don't know if I already mentioned this story, but my friends from Egypt confirmed this to me, what some journalists told me. You remember that Kellen Colonia affair for the New Year, uh, immigrants, although it's much more interesting, many of them were not immigrants from abroad, but, and this is the big enigma of me for, even for these terrorists and so on, that as a rule, most of them are not fresh immigrants bringing bombs from Syria or whatever. <coughs> the typical today's terrorist in the area of London, Bel Belgium, Paris and so on, no, not yet London, you are coming, <laughs> <laughs> is that second generation with the parents fully integrated. So this is why I think it's totally crazy to advocate better integration and so on. No, sorry different integration or total, uh, I mean, their so-called terrorism is their reaction to the integration they got. But let me go on. 
for example, those things that happened in Köln in front for the New Year's Eve in front of the train station. Friends told me in Ramallah when I was there, friends from Egypt, they told me, but that's their usual ritual. <laughs> that this is typical lower class ritual in Egypt. They told me, and then I spoke with Slovene journalists who told me something very sad. They told me that out of the sympathy with protesters, they didn't include this into their reports. That this happened on Tahrir Square every evening. I mean, with our, the good guys. You know, it wasn't rape. It's totally wrong to take it as rape. It wasn't rape. It was a popular carnival. You, I know, opposed to it, consciously vulgar. You pinch a woman for her uh, ass, whatever, ju jump around, but it's not rape. To do it in this way is part of an ordinary ritual. Sorry to tell you, it's a way of life, yes? How do you define rape? I know what I will do, but listen, I'm a good guy here. <laughs> I'm uh, for death penalty for rape, you know. Okay. And I'm even, uh, you cannot imagine how politically correct I am here. <laughs> I'm even saying, okay, I will give you the ultimate example, which I always use, so I'm sorry if some of you know it. I would even say that sometimes, in a situation of violence, not doing a rape can be psychologically more humiliating. What? Yeah, I, I, I know, I expected this. Sorry, you fell for my dirty trick. Psychologically, I said, no, 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 I'm not one of those Western guys who said, oh, but psychological uh, 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 pressure can be much worse than physical torture. I'm tempted to tell them, but did you ever witness a real juicy physical torture? When somebody cuts off your balls, makes you eat them, cuts off your eyes, you know. But nonetheless, you know what I'm thinking here? I'm sorry, now I would have my own clip. I hope you know it. Did you see... David Lynch, uh, Wild at Heart. Yes, a long yeah. time ago. Uh, we are, oh, I know, oh, I know, road, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people are telling me a couple of years ago, life begins at 60, now <laughs> soon they will tell me, but life begins at 70, <laughs> at the end this life begins at death. <laughs> it's the Christian <laughs> solution. No. no, sorry, what I want to say is this. You remember, you should see, it's one of the most psychologically violent scenes that I know. The thing goes like this, lady played by, how is it called, for, forgot her name, uh, is in the room and a disgusting sleazy guy uh, played by Willem Dafoe enters, Laura sorry? Laura Dern. Laura Dern, yes. He enters the room and starts to harass her without Pressure. touching her. And he, you know, it's very well shot because he has these extra big teeth, very vulgar, and he gets very close to her and shouts, say fuck me, say fuck me, say fuck me. And before that he shouts at her, it's very painful. But then the reverse is even more painful. Finally, totally desperate, she says, yes, fuck me. You know what happens then? She steps back and says, thanks honey, nice offer, but today I don't have time, I have to go. In a way, it's so, don't you see, it's so humiliating for her. Because by treating the result of his brutal violence as her, as her genuine yes, he in a way, you know, like exposes her as if she wants, I, I feel this as the ultimate violence, in a way. No, I'm not saying it works. Okay, I withdraw there. Yeah, I'm just saying that you can feel the violence here. Mm. Because, you know, where I agree here with, otherwise I have polemics with her, but I often mention this, with uh, Judith Butler. I agree with her that the trick with today's authority is that denying itself as authority, presenting today's boss, no longer comes with the tie and shouts at you, today's boss comes winks at you, did you have a good fuck la last night, let's take a drink, and so on. At the same time, he exerts full authority as a boss, but masked as a pseudo-friendliness. And here, Judith Butler made once this point, how uh, uh, the first feminist gesture today, 
It's not even before you rebel against male domination. It's to put pressure on the men. Like, if you want to be a boss, a master, please act as one. Don't treat me as equal when you are not. This is, I think, a very intelligent strategy because it's not possible, you know. Today, it's, all, it's de facto prohibited you appear ridiculous to openly act as a master. Today, the main target, I think, is this, at least in, I don't know, educated circles or whatever, middle class. No, no man would say, it's the same as with racism, my God. Almost nobody today, okay, there are, uh, but mostly it's out of fashion to be openly a racist, no? It's much more fashionable to be this discreet cultural racist. What I call racism of what Lacan calls object small a. You know, like, I love foreigners, name them, Jews, Arabs, uh, blacks, but, and then you just have a tiny but, I don't like the smell of their food. Their music is too loud. Uh, wh when they laugh, they laugh in a too noisy way, whatever, and so on. So, my point is that uh, this is why racism is so vibrant today. I know those new materialists who talk about vibrant matter. Well, the, mo the, the vibrant matter that I know is the vibrant matter of racism in everyday life. I mean, it's uh, incredible how this functions. Uh, uh, so it's very important. Again, I made my point clear. On the one hand, yes, we should be critical against violation of human rights uh, 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 among I Islamists. But first, we should absolutely bear in mind to what extent, that's why I mentioned Poland and so on, this return of fundamentalism is by far not limited to Islam. Listen, I read recently a report from Soviet Union, we, uh, ex-Soviet Union, Russia, we laugh so much when we hear, when we read about, uh, you know, all that, ho all those horrible stories, I know they are horrible, like I read now in Qatar, a Dutch flight attendant once we were allowed to call them stewardesses, you know, in a <laughs> flight attendant, okay. Uh, 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 she visited a party, was there raped by a local guy and denounced the guy to the police. The result was she was, uh, she got, I don't know, prison penalty for soliciting illegal sex. Because she said, I did nothing, but the idea is that if you go out alone, it's automatically assumed you wanted it. Okay, okay, we can laugh at Arabs, but are you aware that I read a terrifying report from some Russian group, my friends there connected with those pussy riot told me, that this is absolutely the predominant attitude in Russia, at least in provincial towns. Whenever a woman is raped, it's automatically assumed that somehow she must be responsible, that she somehow provoked it. So, it's not as simple as... But uh, what I want to say, my point to return, is that uh, this, uh, I think, again, is, is my first point, that uh, it's not... This game doesn't function. We all have our ways of life, and then on the top of it we are engaged in some anti-capitalist global struggle. First, let me say something which made but you really furious when I mentioned to him this, but... Okay, I like his term uh, uh, nomadic proletarians for refugees. But nonetheless, one has to be very careful here. I claim the large majority of those who came to Europe, they didn't come with any, let's call it, proletarian desire. I think it's even mystifying and humiliating for them to qualify them as nomads, because then you get all the Deleuzean bullshit, free, nomad, deterritorialized, etc. No, they are desperate people who lost their home and are desperately searching for a new home. They want, ah, ah, you don't believe it. No. Why? What do you think? Did they enjoy being nomadic? Well, you know what? My parents, they came from Russia, they came to Europe, and my dad wasn't necessarily looking for a new home. 
I don't know what his motivation was, but he was just... He, okay. was, he was appalled by travelling. He wasn't looking for a new home. In fact... Sorry, but you said something that appeared to me contradictory. Okay. You said now he was appalled by traveling. Yes, that's my point. Okay. They don't enjoy we are nomadic. Okay, home is too pathetic a word. They simply want survival, a stable job, and so on. And I don't think there is a priori anything immanently anti-capitalist. They would be... I, I'm almost tempted to say that for a large majority of the refugees, to find a nice job, to be nicely exploited in a Western European yes. way, would have been almost the goal of their life. So, you know, don't make them too quickly like some of my Norwegian friends claim that don't I see that this is the new European working class that will make a revolution. Then I died laughing. I told them, ah, that's nice. So it's the old Marxist game, we have a good theory, we just miss the revolutionary class, so let's import the, this is the latest level of globalization, that we report the revolutionary class now to make it. So what I'm saying is this, the only solution, solution, okay, path that I see is, yes, we do live in, within our each, within, although, again, we do and we don't, because, you know, we don't live in self-enclosed, of course, cultures, civilizations, whatever you call them, way of life. They, they intersect, plus they are immanently self-contradictory. So I think that, that's for me the key point, the struggle for any universality is at the same time a struggle within each culture, way of life, and so on and so on. If you are for universalism, you will, it, it automatically means you will be critical against some basic features of your way of life, you will be critical how to treat others and so on and so on. And here, I think, the only solution is, that's why I find the situation today so infinitely sad, I know I repeat myself, but how the two big struggles Okay, the bigger one is, I admit it, anti-capitalism and so on. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, let's say struggle against global capital and let's say struggle for sexual and uh, feminine liberation. Everything hinges on bringing these two struggles together. If we fail, we should pack our luggage and move, I have two options, Iceland, Reykjavik, Island, or New Zealand, you know, and then wait for the war, maybe we survive it there. <laughs> Why? Because uh, uh, what's so tragic is not only how the, these struggles, two struggles are separated, but how each of these two struggles is even used against the other. Okay, the story we know about Western feminism, Nancy Fraser described it, how the majority of American mainstream feminism was totally co-opted by predominant neoliberalism used to justify invasion of uh, Iraq and so on and so on. And the story that I always repeat, the opposite story, how for many Africans and don't dismiss them just as marginal clowns, like from Kenya to Mugabe in Zimbabwe and so on. The struggle homophobia is part for them, or, or even oppressing women, is part of their struggle against, uh, uh, against neocolonialism in their view. Like, ah, ah, here we have to be clear. I, uh, you should follow what they are doing, Boko Haram. They claim we are the true anti-colonialists. They claim the main cultural effect of global capitalism is the disintegration of our traditional family structure. So, by practicing Boko Haram, no, no education for women, women subordinated, we are fighting the destructive impact of global capitalism. Now, you know what's the tragedy? The tragedy is that, in some absurd sense, it's up to a point true. This is the effect of getting caught in global capitalism. But the answer should be the answer given by some of my Palestinian friends, who are telling me that whatever remains of 
traditional, what we in the West perceive as traditional oppressive family life in Palestina, honor killings and so on, is precisely not undermined but sustained by Israeli occupation. And this was from the very beginning, I claim, the big strategy of uh, colonialism. It's wonderful to read how British colonialism proceeded in India. It was not, oh, we should educate Indians into Western style liberals. No! They, you know that horrible book, uh, The Loss of Manu, which, a book which prescribes in detail uh, the caste system and so on, everything. I mean, there are details there that I cannot buy love with my obscenity. Like, detailed sexual prescription, how? When you make love to a woman, I love these bureaucratic problems. After you finish and you pull out a penis, how should you wipe your penis if there are traces of sperm in it? <laughs> should you look into a woman, turn around, I love these problems. This is my but what I'm trying to say is this, that uh, it was always part of colonialism to sustain, even resuscitate traditional local culture to better dominate the locals. So again, oh, yeah. I'm not, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm following. Yeah. The main, no, I understand the things, but are you saying that there is universalism? Or Absolutely, but it's a matter of, but it's painful painful in the sense that to be truly universalist means to be in critical struggle, conflict with your own predominant. Like, I'm again referring to Susan's book, uh, uh, Hegel and, sorry to awaken you, <laughs> Hegel, Hegel and Haiti, where you have where somewhere in the beginning this wonderful passage where you says that, right, I think that, uh, that it's precisely at this marginal sites where different cultures inter that this is the site of universalism. You know, we, we have to be here Hegelians. Universalism doesn't mean I am what I am and of course as such I'm part of universal culture. No. What, uh, universalism, as Hegel would have put it, means that in your particular existence the universal dimension has to appear as undermining your particular identity. So, there is universalism, but it's, but it's something very difficult, I mean. It's really me, so, uh, uh, what I mean again is that, the, 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 again, the basic premise of fighting against uh, the basic premise, again, should be that I don't think, first, okay, I will try to, sorry, I'm getting confused, as you can see, I will try to somehow <coughs> bring it together. First, I don't think that one can distinguish the good way of life, like, yes, we have our own food, our shitty mix, how some primordial father, heaven screwed the primordial mother, and out of this bullshit the universe emerged, whatever and all that stuff, and food, and manners, and dances, and then, unfortunately, there comes some marginal, okay, and we cut the clitoris of women, okay, and then we do some other things. I think that uh, way of life is a totality, and, and uh, you know, what Benjamin Walter said, that every monument of culture is a monument of barbarism. Absolutely, every particular way of life has this immanent element of barbarism. So, your struggle for universality begins with your struggle against your own par particular, against what is oppressive and so on, in your own particular culture. That's why, conditionally, very conditionally, I still like certain aspects, aspects of what we call European experience. Why? Because Maybe I'm wrong, I would be glad to be wrong, but all I'm saying is this, this. Uh, what you find, for example, in Descartes, is this idea of experiencing your own particular culture, and you can still love it, and so on, as something no less ridiculous than others, as something basically contingent. That's, for me, the ABC of authentic 
multiculturalism. It's not enough to say I respect others. No, you should also turn it around and say they appear stupid to me, but I'm sure that I appear stupid in their eyes. It's a big struggle here. No, it's not UNESCO struggle. That's why I hate all those UNESCO books about human civilization where, oh, wonderful, look how great this civilization is, look how great that civilization is, and so on and so on. So again, my idea is not uh, this type of dirty, unprincipled negotiation. You know, like some friends in... Uh, in, uh, where did I have this debate? In United States, yes. Arab friends. Offer, try to offer me this dirty deal. <laughs> Why don't we now, strategically now, the great enemy are the United States? So why don't we forget about those uh, women's rights and so on and so on? Let's fight the big enemy, you know? No, I don't think it doesn't work. It has to be the same fight. It's painful for all of us. We, in the West, have to be very careful about how our own feminism can have a very definite, especially I claim in its politically correct version, a very definite Western bias. Deplorable. And I always repeat this story. Probably most of you know it. I did the nice, nicest example that I know. That's why I like to repeat it. How years ago when there was still Bosnian war, 20 years ago, even more, a group of American feminists tried to contact some Bosnian society of raped women, and they sent them a questionnaire to establish contact, and a couple of questions. And the first question was, I mean, this was joke all around uh, ex-Yugoslavia. Listen, those desperate women barely survived rape, and first the question was a kind of vulgarized Judith Butler question. Do you think that a woman has an eternal non-historical essence? Or do you know that, they even put it, think, no, or do you know that woman's identity is performatively enacted through repetitive rituals? You know, they just looked at you, you know. So what I'm saying, but, but at the same time, the trick is to convince, for example, that's the big struggle in Palestine now, that, you know, it's a wonderful struggle, I've written about it, I don't know if they published my text, I have problems lately. There is a big cultural conflict now on the West Bank between Asaf is his name, is it Asaf, a big popular from Gaza singer, very kicky one, like this kind of a... The, the correlate in Europe, which have been, do you remember, we are unfortunate old enough, the disgusting Dutch-German guy, Heintje, with this kind of, a, the man with, I mean, death penalty exists for such people. You say mama, remember? Mama? Uh, even better song, more obscene, Mamachi, and then Haichi Bumbaichi, and so, I mean, this is worse than Sound of Music, if you, but, okay, Asaf, and then you have my good friend Tamer Nafar, the rapper. And uh, Asaf said, I respect prohibition of women to sing in public because it's part of my tradition. And Tamer Nafar gave him a wonderful answer. No? Says, he told him that basically, but don't you see that this is what Zionists want? That Zionists love nothing more than those Palestinians who stick to their ancient tradition and so on and so on. Okay. I'm getting lost here, now I come, uh, because I would really like to go through the main line of what I want to say here. Uh, I already developed this once a year ago here, but I want to do it again, I have new twists. Namely, this big battle which is still going on in the United States, transgenderism. I'm mixed there. In principle, yes, but with problems. Why? Uh, you know what is transgenderism. It occurs, that's almost official definition, when an individual experiences a discord between his or her biological sex and the corresponding gender assigned to him or her by society and his subjective identity. But transgenderism does not concern only men who feel and act like women and vice versa, but a complex structure of additional genderqueer positions, which are outside 
the binary opposition of masculine and feminine, bigender, trigender, pangender, gender fluid, agender, and so on and so on. Uh, the most radical position here is uh, so-called uh, post-genderism. The idea is the following one, that today's scientific progress and biotechnology, new reproductive technologies, offer a unique solution of simply overcoming gender division. Yes? Where are these definitions from? Wikipedia. Okay. I'm openly, I admit it. <laughs> okay, I double, triple checked it, but mostly it's Wikipedia. Uh, why? You know, I'm not, no irony here, but do you find them problematic? I think transgenderism isn't a theory, there are transgender lives and transgender people. Yeah, okay, 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 but if for you're me... talking about womanism as if you just discovered women and there's a theory of like, oh, okay, but women, question mark. Okay, okay, only the problem is that when you add ism, it usually means... In case it's not good in this room, yeah. No, no, but I don't mean it in a patronizing way. It means something much deeper, I think. It means that even if we think that something is directly experienced as... Uh, how should I put it? as reality, there are already certain conceptual presuppositions in it. Have you heard of the word gender dysmorphia? Sorry? Gender? Dysmorphia? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you like this one more? Maybe for what you use no. transgenderism. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe. But what I'm saying is this one. Okay. Let me state my position clearly. Uh, the first thing that I find interesting is uh, that the initial experience, let me call it like this, and I totally, I will immediately try to make it clear where I find it problematic, but it's authentic, absolutely, this basic experience which is, you find yourself, okay, slightly ridiculous, but elementary position is entering the toilet and space, and you have a choice, masculine, feminine, you don't recognize yourself in any of the two. I totally accept the authenticity of this. Uh, the first problem just that I want to raise, and there is nothing critical here, is this oscillation how, on the one hand, it's the aim is the multiplication of sexual positions with all those that you add and add and add. And it's very interesting here, because uh, isn't it that now <coughs> Uh, and I'm not making fun of this, I see the problem. First, the formula was LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Then it became LGBTQIA, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, intersex, asexual, and then it goes even more. And then uh, the formula that is being established today is that because you admit that you cannot be complete, you add a plus. So now, at least that's what I was able, I'm gladly offer myself to be corrected, is that LGBT plus, like to include all that maybe we omitted. Okay, I, I totally accept this logic. Uh, for my first reflection is just this one, that uh, it's typical and we find this already in the 1920s in Soviet Union, how this ambiguity of a struggle for, let's call it, sexual liberation, how first you want to, you want to open yourself to all, to all these other possibilities which violate the clear binary division. It's not just masculine, feminine, but again, it's not just only gay, lesbian, but all these complications that I enumerated. But how then this shifts into asexual position? It's interesting how if you look at the struggles for liberation in Soviet Union in the 20s, you have on the one side feminist and other fighting for sexual liberation, liberation of sexuality, but at the same time what emerged, this was part of a very interesting phenomenon, so-called communist Gnosticism. Uh, the idea was that, that the only true liberation is the liberation not of sexuality but, but from sexuality. Mm -hmm. That sexuality as such 
is something which enslaves us into cliches and so on and so on. And you have, to, for example, the one who is for me one of the mega writers of the 20th century, uh, Andrei Platonov. His early works are clearly at this level, Platonov. I, if you look at early Platonov stories, you, you know where you find even traces of this? For example, in, in uh, Tarkovsky, his version of Solaris, it's clear that... Oh, oh uh, sorry, yes, you? Me? Yeah. Uh, no, I wanted to know, uh, so you have a problem with it, that critiques of, uh, well, while there are some people fighting for sexual liberty, there are... No, I not have a problem with this. And others fighting for... Liber uh, liberation from, from sexuality. Yeah, so you don't have a problem with that. It's like no, I'm just <laughs> stating <laughs> this. That uh, it's in a certain terms like violation. Sorry. In non-normative terms like violation. Sorry, sorry, I didn't get your the point of your question. My Could you? No, sorry, the lady behind you. Oh, you're saying that it's uh, you're not saying any. You're not making a moral judgment, right? You're using terms like violation of binary gender. No, 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 violation was even meant in a positive sense here. I'm a madman here. Violence is for me a good thing, I'm sorry to tell you. I'm not even kidding. I've written a book about it. You know why? Because I think that... Uh, first, we have so much of violence which is not, not even experienced as violence, you know. Those who are against violence, my first question is, but how do you relate to violence? Okay, my question is this one. We experience something as violent. The first question that emerges is, but violent with reference to what? To some normal non-violent state. Then my first, the my following question is always, okay, but isn't there a violence already there? In that, what interests me is not only violence which violates normality, but violence needed for the so-called normality itself to reproduce, to reproduce itself. So, that's not a problem. I just, uh, okay, but uh, now we go on. Uh, uh, the, uh, the problem for me, now I come to the true problem, where I see a problem, is this one. Uh, I will return to what I intended to call, ironically, the primordial experience of, without any irony, it's positive, uh, of, of transgender position, which is, again, we can even construct a platonic narrative. I, without any irony, please, I enter a toilet, masculine, feminine, I don't recognize myself in any of the two terms. Yes, I totally submit it. I just claim that's my only problem with LGBT and so on, that there is n this is what, according to Lacan, and here I am a Lacanian, this is what defines sexua human sexuality as such. There are no, everyone, uh, like, I will put it like this, uh, uh, we are not first, here I am more Butlerian than Judith Butler, in the sense that we are not, we do not first have some gender identity, which then doesn't quite function and so on. No, we, uh, gender, assuming a gender identity is already an escape, a way of avoiding a certain radical anxiety of who am I, of subjective destabilization. And this destabilization is constitutive of subjectivity as such. This is why, but that's another story for Jacques Lacan, subjectivity as such is uh, hysterical. For Lacan, again, this is not how to say in German, Schimpfwort. This doesn't mean hysteria is, you know, that's why as a Lacanian I can only laugh when people say, oh, when you use the term hysterical, you dismiss them. No, no, no. For Lacan, even Lacan says someone that science has a science, creative science, science which discovers something new, is structured like a hysterical discourse. Because hysterical discourse, if you know Lacan's theory of discourse, is produces new knowledge and so on and so on. So again, for Lacan, this is the hysterical question. Like, 
what am I? What for an object am I? Or to relate it to gender identity, society is providing me or trying to impose on me an identity, man, woman, or at other levels, class identity, professional. The original hysterical question is, why am I that? Am I that? This questioning yourself as the object. And for, so for Lacan, again, this is why, incidentally, my good friend who will now publish a book on all this, Alenka Zupancic, uh, book with, uh, for the time being, the title is precisely Sex and Ontology. She makes the point that uh, Lacan even, we almost forgot about this, Lacan never, Lacan, uh, sorry, am I talking too much, where are we? Uh, oh no, it's okay, we have time. Lacan never even uses the term sexual difference. Not even once. Uh, uh, because uh, for Lacan, uh, if by for Lacan, sexual difference is not a matter of gender identity. It's not a matter of uh, of gender identity means a specific symbolic social role assigned to you with a set of normative expectations. In our society, to be a man or a woman means this, this, this. Here, Lacan totally agrees with Judith Butler. This is, of course, socially constructed, and so on, and so on. Uh, now, but I will go now to the pr uh, first point. The, uh, uh, the, f the problem I have, maybe I'm wrong, the problem I have with LGBT is this, this original experience. I cannot recognize myself in a certain division. There is no place for me. But for me, the thing to do is to accept this radical uncertainty. Not, isn't there, at least the way I see LGBT, it's as if the binary opposition is oppressive, men, women, but if we expand it enough, maybe we will create a safe place for everyone. You know, like, if we add enough of bigender, ally, transgender, asexual, whatever, so that each will get his or her or their or it, I don't care, proper place. You will never get this, I claim. So, uh, can I... Yeah, you can. No, no, I... So you sustain not more, because there are an opposition that I... I uh, well, I said, I, I talked about it when Jacqueline Rose was talking about trends, that is a, well, so tra trans movements also uh, 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 want to um, find a place for for everybody to feel, uh, as you said, comfortable. Yeah. And you know that a radical feminism said that this, like, the problem is not uh, finding a place for yeah. everyone, but just, you know, finishing with all the categories so everyone can be everything, and so it's like the Lacanian position that you're sustaining. Well, here I think it's, uh, again, a problem. Because when you said abolish all categories so that everybody, so that we don't have any identities, mm -hmm. no? Yeah. Uh, I don't think this is also a too easy way out, I claim. No, but isn't this the, the, the Lacanian, like... No, the Lacanian position is not that, there is, that we are simply out. The Lacanian position is that there is a terrifying anxiety deadlock and so on. Ah, okay, so it's, so it's a much more, if you want, tragic position. That there is a deadlock, an antagonism. And that sex is originally not a matter of identity, but a matter of dealing with a certain deadlock. I will not go into it today, you know, in detail, but uh, again, so again, I'm asking you, uh, I think that both, uh, of course, uh, uh, so what I oppose is, again, either this idea that traditional sexual binary gender roles are oppressive, I agree with that, but that we must replace them with another more detailed categorization, like if you have 20 or 30 choices then, or, or simple fluidity. But why, but why not, uh, immediately, immediately, why not simply move from one to another? It also doesn't work. It presupposes a certain 
freedom of, you know, we are fluid in the... Sorry, but you want it, please. Um, yeah, just in terms of Butler's concept of a livable life, if people are telling you... If people are telling... If people are, like, raising their voices and saying, this is what I need to do in order to live, live a livable life, right? Okay. Who is you yet to police that agenda? <laughs> but what... what Do you... Uh, uh, you are talking this when... In saying immediately... In saying this, you imply that I give a certain, that there is a secret normativity in what I'm saying. Could you specify this normativity? Uh, well, Where did you hear an order in what I was saying? The, I just think it sounds like you're being quite critical of moves to increase modes of gender presentation. No, I don't have any problem with that. The, the, the problem is, uh, my only point is, you will not get rid of anxiety. The dream that bothers me is that, you know, that anxiety is caused by this fix immediately, immediately. Or you want to intervene now? Yes. Brutally, do it. <laughs> but just be loud enough. Because? Because you have the multiplication of identities. Yeah. And by the way, it's even stronger than you're saying. It's not that they don't see themselves in either toilet. It's that they want to go to the other one. That's what the law has been fighting about. That's what the law was passed in America recently, yeah. saying somebody has to go to the toilet of their birth assignation because female to male trans yeah. male to female yeah. transsexuals going to the ladies' hmm. toilet are there for spurious reasons, and therefore the women are at risk, whereas in fact it's the opposite, which is to say that if you're a male to female transsexual and you go into the male toilet, then you're really in, you're really at risk of violation and abuse. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you take the liberal position. You allow for all the positions that people want, and of course you don't assume that solves the problem of sexual being. That's the only position that makes any sense whatsoever. You don't assume that the social transformation the liberalization of the law, the recognition of yeah. the human rights, you don't assume that that in and of itself makes everyone worse, obliges everyone to be happy. That, with this, I totally agree. The only, maybe I'm here even more compromise-oriented, because what I would have done, I'm sorry if this will sound tasteless, but it's no aggressivity meant. The solution came to me when I saw Wait, you know, you get, I like this Hegelian paradox, when you see how now we have to recycle and all that bullshit, you know, and you have like one bottle for, you know, plastic, uh, paper waste, organic waste, and then you have one called general waste. Oh I'm for this. I'm for those who, uh, my solution would have been to respect or you think maybe this is too oppressive, I'm not sure, but my solution would have been like masculine, feminine, and gender as such. And then you take your choice. You think it's too oppressive. You think it marginalizes you already. I don't think you should answer your question. What do I mean by this? Mm -hmm. I don't think you should be saying be it should be this, this, and this. I think trans people are very busy, very effectively, telling us what they want at the level of the way language works and the law should work. You just listen to that. But what you don't do is make the mistake. Yeah, but, but wait a minute. What you don't do is make the mistake of then demanding a sexuality that requires itself to be a utopian fantasy, which as Susan said this morning, a form of individualism which is actually just as kind of a caricature of a consumerist global capitalist yes. form of being. Yeah. So you just have to keep the psychic distress for all of us as a kind of birthright of psychoanalysis that, in the frame. Yeah. You know, I don't think you should be saying we'll have male, female, and whatever the third one which you said. Let everybody get on with it. They're very busy getting on with it. Okay, I... T as concerning the practical measure, I like very much your... Like, sorry, this is patronizing. It's disgusting. I must apologize. I totally agree with your position and I like very much your point and I'm ready to go to the end applying it even to communism. That's what I like about Fred Jameson's American Utopia text where he said communism, you think it will be a paradise? No, it will be a nightmare of jealousy, of envy and so on. But what I'm saying is this, uh, but don't you think that, so do you, 
here I must admit I don't know enough the situation. Namely, do you think that that it's only me who projected into LGBT movement this more that there is a hidden utopian dimension or is it in the movement itself? In other words, would LGBT people uh, accept your definition of give us the right here and then uh, the traumas there outside? We are not talking about that. Read Kate Weinstein, April Ashley, Jan Morris, yeah. they're all Juliet Jacques, they all talk about the anxiety that is not resolved by the transition that goes on being an issue. We really have to distinguish between the psychic discourse and the political demand here. It's a very clear case where we have to look at. No, 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 no. I again, I, uh, I again, I from from my impression from what I was reading is nonetheless that there is a certain also utopian dimension in it, if you ask me. Because now I will make a step further. Now I agree with your solution, but uh, uh, you know because the psychic dimension that you mention is nonetheless, okay, now I will sound, I know, as a traditional um, Marxist or whatever, but it's also not some pure inner psychic dimension. It's part of a certain social dynamic and so on and so on, which is also, like, uh, 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 how should I put it? What I try to show, apropos of this uh, non recognizing myself is that first there is even a clear psychic dimension in for example okay I will exp maybe this is almost perverted what I will now say <laughs> but I when I enter a toilet I have often this problem man my god am I really should I enter that one and so on and so on and I don't think I'm a pervert here I think that that I think that uh, a certain doubting, doubt of one's identity is an integral part even of sexual identity as such. That at its most radical, uh, sexual identity is not I'm fully dead, but it's more I have chosen a certain mode of doubting what I am. <laughs> I'm even tempted to say that a much more interesting way to describe sexual difference would have been to uh, describe it as not two different positions and then we can doubt about them, but that maybe what we generally refer to as femininity is a certain mode of doubting. Am I a woman? And Masculinity, okay, I don't can now. What, uh, what's masculinity then? Sorry? So, what's masculinity? So, okay, femininity is doubting yourself, and what's masculinity then? It's a different mode of doubting. I don't have time to go into it, but I, what the way I were to answer that mm -hmm. is that uh, I think, again, I don't have time to go into it now. You know, Joan Riviere and all that mask, masquerade topic, and so on and so on. Femininity is masquerade, you know. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. That uh, femininity works at that level and uh, it's much less naive if you want than our standard masculine position in, in, in a way that's why I oppose to a certain reading of Lacan of Lacan's notion of jouissance feminine feminine enjoyment as if feminine enjoyment means that behind all the masks of femininity there is some substantial feminine enjoyment, stronger, inaccessible to men, and so on, or out of sight, and so on, and so on. I think this idea of a substantial feminine enjoyment, too intense for a... It's a male fantasy. It's the most reactionary male fantasy. That there is such thing as feminine... Like yes, yes. I'm even ready to go to this crazy point. That the idea that behind all the masks there is a substantial femininity and men were always ready to admit it. All this talk that behind the masks of femininity there is some substantial fem something that is forever a mystery and so on and so on. Okay. That's the ultimate male myth. I think that 
a woman is okay but I don't have time to go into it okay but there is another point my god we are at the end so uh, sorry yes I will try to conclude because I wanted to say another thing which may be much more interesting which I will have to miss first point I want to make is and here I admit that this will be now problematic for some people I claim that nonetheless there is let's call it not sexual different but a certain antagonism I claim that we should distinguish between what we usually refer to as binarism in the sense of gender position and a, a more radical level of sexual antagonism. Uh, what do I mean by this? Let me draw a parallel for which I will now co I come to the authentic philosophical point of what I wanted to make. Maybe we should go on tomorrow. Look, uh, let me draw a parallel which I know is suspicious. A parallel with uh, class distinction. You know, like, uh, of course, I'm not saying, I still think class struggle is fundamental, but in a way it's not binary. In what sense? You never have two classes. You never have... Uh, but the paradox is this one. If there were only clearly two classes, there would no longer have been class struggle. Class struggle means there are two classes plus some excess. And that excess is not some remainder which cannot be uh, uh, assumed into the class struggle. That excess is the difference, the antagonism as such of class struggle. Which is why, uh, so you see my point that, uh, like, uh, we usually say that class struggle is never clear, that it's always displaced. You never have workers versus those in power, you always have a third element, the distinction is blurred, pseudo-populism, and so on. But this distortion is class struggle. So you see my point. The very thing, class struggle is in a way its own distortion. And I'm claiming the same thing goes for sexual difference. That it is its own distortion. It, I know, it's more complex, but what I'm on, I even wanted to quote since now Turkey is in fashion, and I think it's a catastrophe, incidentally, as we all know what happened there two days ago, you know. The key enigma is, I love this. Uh, 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 Erdogan said, you know this, this, this is a divine gift, this coup. So, to track down all who were behind the coup, okay, I can understand with a certain logic you arrest generals, officers. But why almost 3,000 judges, you know? Obviously, the list was uh, ready. But what I... is that... Uh, that would be my point. I quote it in one of my books already. Uh, uh, a friend from Turkey told me, you know, there was a very mysterious death penalty in the 1920s, I think. A woman was publicly hanged in Turkey as a witch horror who was basically a woman dressed as a man, I even don't know how to categorize her. She was perceived as monster. And she was, it's very mysterious, because she was hanged precisely, not by some Muslim fundamentalists, but by the Kemalists. And my point is that she was different as such. She was what is traumatic, unbearable about sexuality. So you see my point. We. This is how, for me, sex sexual antagonism works. We have, okay, two normative sexes, and then it is as if, I know the paradox of what I'm saying, apart from men and women, the difference between the two has, has to exist as such in a third term. You see my point? I don't theorize it as we have some Deleuzean plurality, hundreds of partial drives, which are then violently compressed into two gender roles. No, I claim uh, we have two roles, gender roles, and then we, we have the two sexes plus their difference as such, embodied in the excess, in the excess. It's the same logic as politically with Hegel, for example, you have different two classes, and then you have rebel or however you call it, which is not simply outside, but is 
the difference is such. And here we enter my Hegelianism. Okay, I have to stop. I will. I wasn't too good today. I know. I will have to. But one thing I would like, if you give me five minutes to go on, because uh, you know, part of this struggle is uh, or difference is how what worries me is today that today a new conservative orthodoxy is emerging <coughs> which differentiates itself from fundamental what worries me for example in my country and other countries is how what is perceived as this new fundamentalism is criticized from basically a neoconservative position which presents itself as much more reasonable, moderate, and the philosophical background interests me. It's a wonderful story of paranoia, of uh, conspiracy theory. I love them. The theory is this one. You, we blame Islam for everything. It, uh, Islam is responsible, on the one hand, for today's fundamentalism, and at the same time, for uh, political correctness and all this fluidity, transgenderism, how can they prove this? I think, but I support Islam here, that they are right. Uh, Ernst Bloch, a German Marxist, already come to this in his wonderful short book Avicenna und die Aristotelische Linke, you know, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, was a Muslim interpreter of uh, Aristotle, and he gave a certain reading to Aristotle, which, although partially appropriated by Thomas Aquinas, basically goes against it and points the way towards nominalism. So, this is the most beautiful neoconservative conspiracy theory that I know, disgusting but typical. It goes like this. The origin of all, uh, the ultimate good, supreme good is uh, Thomas Aquinas. This realist vision, universe, rational, harmonious, divine, everything has a meaning, women, men, everything has its place and so on. And, uh, and uh, realist ontology against idealism. In the, the, there are no ideas outside people. We live in a harmonious world where universality is immanent to reality, objects exist outside. And you know whom today's neo-Thomists so-called love? Uh, dialectical materialism. What happened in a debate in late 40s and early 50s was something incredible. The direct sign of the gay guy was here, Josef Bochensky, a theologist, Catholic, who wrote a book on dialectical materialism, surprisingly praising it. Said, but forget about God, but this dialectical materialist view, you know, totality, harmonious, higher, lower, but this, this is practically what we neo thomists are claiming, and especially they like this. Uh, realist ontology, objects exist out there, we come to know them, this Aristotelian moderation. So they claim that Avicenna, Ibn Sina, in his reading of Aristotle, gave to it too much of a nominalist twist, cutting this living link between experience of external objects and conceptual universe. And the idea is this one, this opened up the way, on the one hand, to Islamist fundamentalism, because it means you have direct access to divine texts, bypassing empirical reality, it's just the sacred word, but at the same time, once you have this gap, you can proclaim that, you know, that reality is just a social, uh, uh, just a social construct, different nominalist versions, we cannot ground it in reality. So, in a wonderful way, Islam is blamed. But thinking about you, uh, 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 Susan, when you wrote the dead bookman, the Islamist of Haiti revolution, where, what if Ibn Avicenna is the bookman of modernity in this sense? That, what if, I mean, I don't have any problems, I'm proclaimed Islamophobic and so on. 
But I like this idea that maybe, and Ernst Bloch went into this, that it was absolutely crucial for modernity did arise with Dun Scotus and this uh, nominalist counteracting to, uh, to this uh, Thomist uh, totality, uh, uh, organic totality, much, much loved by Thomas Aquinas and so on. Even, unfortunately, in Lenin you find traces, in materialism and bureaucraticism, he praises very much certain idealist philosophers, which, you know, the problem for Lenin is gap, subjective, objective. He liked this organic total. So, but what I'm saying is that, uh, what if they are right, but just we have to turn it around, that maybe what generated modernity, this minimal theoretical gesture, was, my God, maybe, this certain nominalist, reading, misreading, it doesn't matter, of Aristotle, because you have to remember this, how, how all these guys were highly appreciated. I think for Thomas Aquinas, no? when he says philosopher, he means Aristotle. And when he says interpreter, he means Avicenna, I think. No? You know, it's not even a name, it's a concept, you know. Like, that's my secret dream, it will never be true. That Lacan would be the psychoanalytic theorist and uh, I would be the interpreter of Lacan, <laughs> but it will never happen, you know. But what I'm, so what I'm saying is that what if it really happened, that this was the last glorious moment of Islam, that they gave this push which then led to, you know, all great things, from Dun Scotus and so on, to... Uh, this, the gap, the gap was fully, the gap was uh, fully, uh, was uh, fully, uh, the gap was fully admitted. No, but this, this uh, entire conspiracy theory is even nicer, I love it. It begins with Frankfurt School. You know, namely they claim, these neoconservatives, that uh, how did we end up where we are in political correctness? When a revolution failed in 1920s, Communists discovered why it failed, because, uh, because uh, 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 communism was too much focused on economy and was not strong enough to undermine morality of Christianity and so on. So the idea is that then uh, communists directly financed via the tour to Argentina, Frankfurt School, even if Frankfurt School pretended to be opposed to uh, Soviet Marxism, it was really working for it. Its task was to undermine from within Western Christian morality so that in a second stage uh, they can win. And then this is why in this paranoiac reading there is no opposition between Islamic fundamentalism and political correctness. They are strictly two sides of the same engendered by uh, by the, and the ultimate culprit is Islam. But again, I'm tempted to accept this just, of course, in the opposite sense. That maybe, you know, because this was maybe the mega revolution, this, the first gap in this medieval view, that maybe this was, my God, done by, done by Islam at that point. We just don't know enough about it, but at that point, Great things did happen in Islam. So, okay, I was too long. I'm sorry. I'm dissatisfied by myself. Tomorrow we go, I finish this, and then I will go into directly into what is communism today and so on and so on, because there are big things to decide. If tomorrow I'll be better. I feel bad. I know I will do the usual Jesuit, no Jesuit, Opus Dei things. I will whip myself this evening. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> But I really like what 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 uh, what uh, what Jacqueline said. It's true, yes, that keep keep. But still, I would like to to analyze that. Uh, how she call this? Uh, you know, this subjective anxieties and so on and so on. My God, they are also social categories. Oh my God! Just a second. Yeah. To whom your name to is? Christina, what it is. Ah, the Russian way. The Russian ah, it way, says exactly. here. Yes. Slava, very good. Yeah.